think is going on just from this like. So when do dx's and 17oxs correlate? What's that? So they, they correlate. I think my you know, quick and dirty interpretation, they correlate when evaporation is driving both of them. They don't correlate when evaporation is not driving one. You know, some, so basically, we now have more information about this storm than we did with just 18-0, just 16-0, 2-H, and 1-H, right? Something is driving, maybe evaporation is driving here, but there's something, something just driving a variation in 17 excess with no variation in d excess. okay? A lot of where we are now is we don't totally understand why, but we see significant <laughs> relationships and we're starting to unpack them, okay? So this is something that she didn't focus on in her paper, but so this is within storm variation that's really valuable. And within a storm variation, she sees a 40 per meg variation, which, which is the difference that, you know, Bar the, with Boaz Lewis sees between seawater and his average meteoric water. So this is a big, you know, we can, I can measure, you know, I can, I can definitely get with you within 10 per meg, and on a good day and good samples, I can, you know, some samples we can get within 5 per meg variation. So this is within our error of we can really understand. Okay, so we know that what we know at this point in 2014, before we started making our measurements, is that there is actually a lot. There's 100 per meg, a lot sort of in this space, but you know, there's 0.1 per meg variation in CAP 17 of meteoric water. So if you're using, so the hydrosphere and the biosphere is probably not constant, right? If you're using in those other models that I talked about earlier, right? There's variation in here. Um, it seems like initially people thought that it might be controlled, uh, the variation in CAP 17 might be really controlled by the humidity of the source area. And, but I think you really need to consider kinetic effects associated. This is the supersaturation of snow during high latitudes. I think the role of convection might be really important in mixing within a convective sort of column might be really important. Um, and evaporation in the tropics might be really important. So a lot of this rainfall is actually falling quite below what um, was established as the meteoric water line. And so I, you know, I think from these initial data from 2014 that the meteoric water line needed to be reevaluated. Um, so moving on quickly, what Xu Ning did, once we got this method up and running, we're like, OK, we, we're, we believe ourselves things are, we're making these measurements well. She did a tap water study in conjunction with Leslie. Um, and these are, the, these are from plots that you guys have seen before of what we would expect delta 18 of precipitation to be, but delta 18 of tap water to be. This measurement is long and tedious, so we couldn't measure everywhere. But these were where Xu Ning samples came from. She screened them, the ones that are, uh, Triangles, I think, were the ones that the delta 18 we basically threw them out because the delta 18 of didn't make sense with what we would sort of expect tap water to be. So we had concerns about them, so we didn't think of them as representative. We didn't think that they were representative of precipitation. But anyway, this is an isoscape that she basically built just from her samples. And we're, you know, her samples are, I show this because they're generally representative. And what she sees for, this is her, you know, I know it's limited, but the, you know, it's early days, but we see a variation, a geographical variation in CAP 17 in the U.S. from tap water. Um, and we see it ranging um, anywhere from, you know, zero to 40 per, mil, for, per meg, so a similar kind of variation before. It seems like we have our highest, our, our, lowest, our, our lowest values in the Gulf of Mexico, highest values up sort of the northwest and the northeast, okay. Um, and the paper, which is, this is the, one of the papers that assigns in GCA, talks about some of the different reasons of why, and there might be evaporation, um, or might be even closest sort of, close um, CAP 17, you know, just due to the Gulf of Mexico storms that's doing here. I think actually these, these low, these higher CAP 17 you know, values are actually associated with snow. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. So this is our first take, this is the first data from the US, and the first geographic spread that we, this is the first geographic CAP 17 data on waters that we had, just to say how much variation should we see in tap waters, which are the most integrated look. And so the, the values are coarse, but there is some geographic sort of splitting out, which is useful. Okay, so that's where those, these plots are where Shuning's data now fall. And if they're all, so the average US top water samples are 17, or 17 per meg, not 35, 35 per meg. So we're continuing to understand what, what global 17 is. And is global 17 even a useful number? Maybe not, right? Like, what's the point of this, an average? It's actually, there might be really different processes influencing 17 depending upon where you are. So maybe this global, it depends on what you're using that global number for. Okay, I'm just gonna skip over this, but sort of what we see here, um, that I'm going to sort of get down to this. Uh, so we, you know, we're sort of changing the picture here. And one question that I had is tap water representative precipitation. So if we sample precipitation, what's the range that we get? So this is where we're starting to work with Renee Brooks, who I knew I had seen that she had worked um, in. She had a really lovely watershed rainfall study um, in Corvallis. But then I was like, oh, I need to talk to Jeff Welker, who runs the, who analyzes a 
the precipitation samples that are collected by the NADP, the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, they collect water samples and you can go and you can ask for them and you can analyze them. And Jeff Welker in Alaska has basically come up with this, you know, they're weekly samples from this whole network of places. All these circles are places where Jeff has a network of U.S. precipitation. And he's been publishing them over the years and analyzing them for Delta 18 and Delta D. And so I asked Jeff, could we sample some of these that you've already analyzed for Delta 8D and Delta 18O for 17O. So the benefit of some of these 17O studies is I can say, I know that something's been measured for Delta 18O and Delta D, I can sort of use that as to, to guide my sampling. So it's starting to, you know, hard to kind of get samples and get them dug out of storage and the right ones and from the, you know, so, but we basically isolate, we ended up analyzing over 100 weekly precipitation samples from 25 different stations. I, I really wanted to get a transect up here and a transect across here. This transect across here is what really ended up, we got the most samples from. Targeting November, a winter sort of interval, and a May at a summer interval. The problem is, you know, you don't have rain from, you want, I would love to basically take a snapshot of like two weeks of the whole U.S., but like it doesn't rain at every station <laughs> for the same two weeks. So, like, so, you know, you sort of have to deal with the, just the natural, the natural, the what's of the sample. So we have, most samples are from 2006, some are from 1997. Anyway, so we sort of did what we did. Um, and in conjunction with this EPA study that I got from Renee, which was sort of great, but in the end of the day, there's actually not that much variation at this station. So it was a little bit, it, sort of interesting, but a little bit of a bust. So what do we see after all this work? Um, I've got, so the first things that we measured were measured summer. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to measure summer precipitation. So this is delta A to no in the red from this, from this transect of samples up here, this sort of northwestern U.S. So we see, you know, neg they range from negative 15 to plus 5, hmm, pretty reasonable. They range from 40 plus 40 to, holy cow, negative 60. I saw these red samples, and these blue and these green ones are from Corvallis. Okay, so they're, they're not, there's not as much variation. I saw, this, these are the, the red ones were the first ones we analyzed, and I thought, oh no. They're so low. Like, are, what is going on with these summer, is summer precip represented, like, what is going on with summer precip? It basically is sort of off the charts for this, for, for all the, you know, Meteoric water average is 35 per meg, Naomi, come on. So what's going on with all these rainfall samples? So I said, okay, let's, Jeff, can we have some winter samples? So I measured the winter samples, and holy cow, it makes sense that they're negative in, um, they're lower in delta 18 space, but they almost don't overlap in CAP 17 There's a complete, so, I mean, they do overlap some, but, so if you then plot it with DXS, I was like, okay, well, you know, if, if evaporation is just driving these samples, we should see the same relationship between all the high delta 18 samples should all be low in DXS. Well, it's not the same. We see this really interesting relationship in delta 18 and cap 17 that we don't see in DXS. Okay. Um, then I said, okay, well, let's just plot DXS versus 17 access because evaporation is driving it. We really should see that relationship. I see, you know, we see, and this, I'm putting this sort of the, the you know, remember that evaporation experiment, it was really two per, two per, you should see a two per meg change in CAP 17 for every one per mil change in DXS. And this is where these slopes would line. And there's a couple samples, these really low samples, I think these are probably evaporated, these are driven by evaporated, these are summertime storms that are evaporated, we're seeing that. But the rest of this, there's not, you know, this, all of this sort of variation that we're seeing in CAP 17 we're not seeing a similar variation in DXS. So something, we're capturing something else that we didn't capture before. So what else would you plot it against? You're Naomi, you're scratching your head. You just <laughs> spent all this time generating this data. Now you need to, so help me out. What, would you, what else would you plot? You, you're like water hydrology isotope people. Like what else would, what is delta 18 of area? What would you plot it against? Elevation, what else would you plot it against in the US? Yeah, longitude. What else really affects delta 18 of values of water? Humidity, amount effect, right? Please, let's shake the tree. Do we see anything? Longitude, precipitation, and elevation split by winter precip is in the, um, the blue, summer precip is in the red. This is CAP 17 you know, So if you go longitude, so you know, pretty much the sample, it, there's no clear <laughs> variation in CAP 17 you know, The biggest trend is season, right? Precipitation amount, eh, so sure, these low CAP, these are the evaporated samples, right? But, it doesn't, you know, so we, we have, it, it doesn't, it still, still season is a lot, you know, these low precipitation storms, these, these low winter storms seem to give high cap 17 where these low summer storms give lower 17 Elevation, there's totally nothing going on. So you could be disappointed, but if you were, if you want, if this showed everything that Delta 18 showed, then there'd be no reason to measure it, right? 
this is in some ways exciting because it's actually not varying with something that we can measure, right? It's telling us something different. I haven't written this up yet. I still need to sort of totally figure out what's driving this. I actually, what the next thing that I need to do is I want to look into the amount of convection in terms, so I want to understand what low temperature is doing to why snow would actually be higher in CAP 17 -0. So is there something in happening in snow formation that would give you higher in CAP 17 -0? And then I also need to parse these out by convective activity and storm, and if that's going to, if convection is, is influencing it in low 17 -0. Um But where we are with this, if you then look at shootings, so there's a lot of variation here. It's varying in some ways. It's different from delta 18 -0. If you look at it with respect to shootings, tap water, these are her tap water samples, and these are the, pre, the summer and the winter precip samples. So tap water is approximating, you know, it's giving us a, obviously the tap water samples are not from the same places where we, you know, but, you know, it's giving us a relatively good average. So they're not crazy low numbers, those tap water values that Shunin got. Um, all right, so our takeaway points from what we've known now so far is that we extend the range. Now we have those, we have that precipitation data, at least from the U.S. Um, we know that we could get a big range in CAP 17 -0 values. I would say that these storms are probably, even though they represent a range, they're probably not going to contribute a lot to any sort of system because they're probably small events. But what we have to do is, you know, if you have summer recharge in a system versus winter recharge in a system, you know, is this a tool for telling the part, in addition to other tools, summer versus winter re recharge? I don't know, but seasonality seems to be the biggest take-home message so far from these data. Um, there's no strong amount effects. Um, the lowest values are driven probably by evaporation, that's the DXS says. There's a strong trend in Delta 18 and CAP 17 -0, but, but we can't explain it with our usual culprits for what drives variation in Delta 18 -0. And these tap waters seem to be representative, which is what we would sort of expect, but it's nice to see. So you could sample a tap water sample and sort of say, okay, I'm getting a good sort of average number, which is really useful because it's a lot easier to sample, to, 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 to use tap waters as integrators. So if we now add these data on, to our global, this is now what the precip looks like. So this curve is really different, <laughs> you know, and maybe we have, you know, maybe on the, the left-hand side, colder temperatures on this left one, um, we see the kinetic effects of, of low, temperature form, low temperature snow formation. On the right side, we see the kinetic effects of, of evaporation during precipitation and maybe convection, maybe that mixing, that low cap 17 that comes from mixing, maybe we're starting to see this. But, um, I would wager, it depends on what your use is, but an average, this is, you know, that 35 per minute, like an average value is not going to be as useful for global, you know, you really need to know, are you looking at rain samples? And then if you just look at sort of the mid, you know, negative 30 up, which is like what a lot of water on the earth is, if you're not including the ice, then this relationship looks very different, right? Um, so it depends on where you're looking. So, but I think now we have a good basis for going into the geologic record at least and having a sense for um, a little bit more of the variation. There's lots more to do to understand it, but I think we're, we have a little bit more of the parameter space with it. The next study that I did was shooting, and I'm gonna, I know I'm sort of out of time. I'm just going to show you this plant, this plant study, and then I'll skip the tooth enamel study, and if you guys want to ask me about it, I'd be happy to tell you about it. But, so, th sorry, um, this, is, uh, this is that same plot that I just showed you before, but I've just expanded the x-axis. So this plot before of the y-axis. So this goes to 80 to negative 80. Now 80 to negative 80, but I've expanded it to negative 300. And I've expanded the delta 18 and that's why we're adding plants. And so Shuning just has a, pub a paper that was published in EPSL where um, Ama El Lande had published a study in 2006 from a first plant water study, so first 17 in plants, that are these open circles that show how plant water is so low in CAP 17 um, why does plant water get so low in CAP 17 now? Yeah, this is evaporation of plant water. This is a big signal, actually. You know, our precision is like 5 to 10 per meg. Like, we can see this big time. Yeah. I owe you some money, too, Kate, because we, uh, we did it. And yeah. So it's beautiful in deuterium excess. So Alma El Lande in 2006, didn't, she didn't measure the excess of her samples, which is like maddening, but it was great for us because we're like, now we have the first study in plant water. Thing. So we, this is Xu Ning's data. So all of this data is Lande and, Xu, and Lee. So the 2006 study and our 2017 study, we had the comparison in DXS um, for plants now. And so it's, and it's, it's, it's very similar to the slope in US precipitation of what we would expect to the relationship. So it's, it's a lower slope, it's a lower relationship that you would expect in our pan evaporation experiment. So that was like two per meg change for in CAP 17 over every one per mil change in DXS. Now it's like around one and a half 
per meg for every per mil. Amel Lonsday also saw that in her um, Niger study in terms of tracking DXS and 17 access. And Xu Ning's paper, which is in the list, but I didn't. Uh, I can give you a PDF if anyone's interested in it. What we also did is she did diurnal variations in leaf water and looking at changes in leaf water, CAP 17 OD access through time and modeling it. And I think what we're learning in this, looking at 17-0 access carefully is we're learning that we don't understand 18-0 fractionation and deuterium fractionation as well as we did, right? You know, when you, when you have, you have the same systems, you have this water molecule and you have these multiple isotopologues of it. Now we can say, okay, well, if that process is really driving fractionation in the deuterium, it should be the same process as driving fractionation in the 17-0. And now we can, met, we're starting to punch more windows into the system and constrain it. And so we're working, so basically, she names, we, we struggle over this because the model don't work you know so we think that it's also is is leaf water instead it's we think that it's when it gets the d-axis and 17 access are uncoupled whether it's in steady state or not in steady state in terms of the leaf water for fractionation so we're you're starting to be able to sort of even in terms of plant physiology and hydrology this could be really interesting because we now have another measurement that we can make and we only need a couple microliters which is easy to do in leaf waters yeah so this is all leaf water yeah the greens is all leaf water yeah and the, I just, the blues are the, the rainfall data. Um, so uh, we're, we're like slowly chipping away at this. And um, I won't show it to you, but if you're interested in the example, the, the example that I was going to show you from the geologic record was in teeth. And the reason why I was going to pivot to teeth after this is because, OK, I get my, I'm a giraffe, and I get 20% of my oxygen isotopes are from breathing in. But where are the rest of my 80% of my oxygen isotopes from? water that I drink, but if I'm in a giraffe in a place where there's water is not really accessible, then I get a lot of my water from leaves, right? So if I'm in a place where my leaf water is really enriched, my leaf water is going to be telling me my 17-0, um, and it's going to be, I could use it as an indicator of aridity. And I'll just, I'll flash the data. It basically, it works. So we measured it in giraffes and hippos in Africa. Giraffes in arid places look like they're eating leaves with low cap 17-0. And in music places, they're eating cap 17 of higher of uh, water with ca higher cap 17 So we think that we can use this. We thinks we can use it as an indicator of aridity. So I'll just flash to those data, and I be so you guys can go to lunch. But I'll be happy to talk about any of this um, with you guys. Oh, that's the data. Oh, darn it. That's the data. So um, thanks.